Good afternoon, students, and welcome to episode 13a of Mind Altering Substances in the Ancient World. I'm your host, as usual, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're continuing our deep dive into the wine industry. In the last lecture, we looked at how grapes were grown and wine was produced in the ancient Roman world. We learned that just like today, there was cheap, lowly regarded table wine, mulsum for the Romans, two buck chuck for us, as well as expensive, highly regarded wine, so Falernian for the Romans, a fine Napa Cabernet for us. One of the big takeaways from that lecture was that the wine industry was huge, involving farmers and potters and slaves and elite landowners, and that had a big effect on population movements in ancient Rome. So slaves were imported into Italy to work huge farms, and as a result, smaller farmers couldn't compete and moved into the cities. Likewise, in this lecture, uh, we're going to look at how the distribution of wine is entangled with all sorts of people and industries, everything from ceramics to shipping to insurance and more. So let's set sail on the Wine Dark Sea. That was Homer's fam uh, favorite kind of name for it. Uh, and discover how wine moved around in the ancient Roman world. We learned in the last lecture that the Romans were the first to start growing grapes and making wine in some of the most famous wine regions of the Old World. Bordeaux and Burgundy in the Rhone Valley in France, the Rioja region of Spain, and the Moselle Valley of Germany, not to mention places like Tuscany and Sicily in Italy proper. But in order for the Romans in the city of Rome to be able to enjoy a nice glass of French wine from Bordeaux, ancient Bertagala, that wine had to travel over 1,300 kilometers over the course of at least 20 days, and that's without planes, trains, or automobiles. And that doesn't really even kind of start talking about the scale of the issue. It's estimated by the Roman historian David Potter that something like 100 million liters of wine were needed for consumption just in the city of Rome each year. So think about that, 100 million liters just for one city each and every year. We'll stop talking about how much wine Romans actually drank in the next lecture on consumption, but just get the idea that there was a lot of wine moving around the empire. And transporting wine comes with a series of challenges that are unique to that industry. The vessels used for transport, for example, need to be airtight because oxygen ends up interacting with the wine and eventually turning it into vinegar. If you don't believe me, leave a bottle of red wine uncorked for a week or so and you'll end up with a terrible wine, but a pretty nice salad dressing. Vinegar, really. Second, you've got to be able to move the storage containers easily, but they've got to be strong enough that they don't break. Kind of a delicate balance between weight and strength. Third, wine storage vessels often need to be opened and resealed on multiple occasions to test the wine, that sort of thing. And then finally, you generally don't want the storage vessel interacting with the wine, flavoring it in some sort of weird way. And we'll talk about oak barrels kind of at the end, uh, about how that's actually a good thing for the flavoring of wine in the modern world, but in general, you don't want those interactions taking place. For ancient Rome, the answer to these challenges begins right where we left off in the last lecture. If you recall back to the production process, you'll recall that it went something like growing the grapes, harvesting the grapes, stomping the grapes to produce must, that juice on the inside, then mechanically pressing the grapes to further extract the must, then filtering it to separate it from the stems and skins and all that other junk, then letting it ferment, uh, and then allowing um, the wine to age in storage jars known as amphorae. Side note, uh, so the Latin plural of the word amphora, right, the ceramic vessels that we're going to be talking about is amphorae, right, A-M-P-H-O-R-A-E. And these amphorae are both the last step in the production process and the first step in the distribution process. During the Roman Empire, and actually quite a bit before that in Greece and in Egypt, Amphorae were the way to transport liquids like wine and olive oil and fish sauce across the Mediterranean. Over time, the sizes and shapes became somewhat standardized, although there were always kind of a variety of standard forms in use at any given time. And this standardization helped improve the efficiency of the entire process since things could be measured more easily, stored more compactly, and produced more efficiently. The standard form of a generic amphora is a little weird. You might expect it to be a big bowl with a tight-fitting lid, but that's not exactly what we get. Instead, amphorae tend to be long and slender, with a pointy foot on the bottom, known as the foot, a bulging body, and a narrow neck leading up to a slightly larger rim. On each side of that neck, there tend to be two handles. The whole thing would usually fit something like 25 liters of wine and weigh around 50 pounds. 
So what's up with that weird shape? Like why build a ceramic vessel that would just tip over if you put it in the middle of the room? Well, the answer to that lies in the distribution process. Most amphorae were transported on ships. And so the foot of the amphora was placed on the floor, usually in some sand to keep it steady. And then the body was leaned slightly against the wall. And then the beauty of it is in between the gaps towards the top of the amphorae, a second row, like kind of a second story of amphorae could be stacked. And then a third story on top of amphorae on top of that second story. So this weird little shape made it easy for stacking in the holes of ships. And you can see that here. The rest of the design was also intentional. The handles obviously were for carrying and pouring the amphora and the narrow neck reduced the surface area of the liquid that was exposed to air. So it prevented it from turning it into vinegar. It's actually the exact same reason that wine bottles have a narrow neck today. Moreover, the little point foot would collect the lees, the dead yeast, and the dregs, the sediment, in the wine so that wouldn't go in with all the other liquid. Pretty smart design after all. That didn't mean it was perfect though. Sealing the amphorae was always a tricky task, and an important one since oxygen will turn your wine into vinegar. Romans tried clay or ceramic stoppers like you see here, they tried cloth stoppers, wax stoppers, and eventually cork stoppers, just like today. These were usually coated with resin, kind of plant or tree sap, in order to maintain the airtight seal. Some ancient Roman authors commented on how winemakers experiment with different types of resins to add different types of flavors to the wine as well. And we'll remember from last week that adding different flavorants, right, spices, honey, lead, that sort of thing, was fairly common in the ancient Roman world. And it's not like these ceramic amphorae just appeared out of nowhere. Someone had to get the clay, mold the clay, fire the clay for each and every one of these. And if we take Potter's assumption that approximately 100 million liters of wine was produced for Rome each year, we can assume that each amph and we can assume that each amphora carries about 25 liters of wine, which they do on average. That's about 4 million ceramic amphorae needed to get the wine to Rome each year. 4 million just to get wine to Rome. That's not the whole empire, that's just the city. The weight of each amphora was around 50 pounds, and cleverly they were designed so that the weight of the vessel itself was just about equal to the weight of its contents. So that if you're sailing a ship and you need to balance, one full amphora is equivalent to two empty, empty amphorae. Either way, that's about 200 million pounds of clay needed each year to produce all these amphorae. Then you've got to actually take that clay, shape it into the vessels, and go about firing those vessels. And when it comes to large amphorae, this process tended to occur at fairly large-scale pottery manufactories. We don't call them just factories because they're a little bit smaller in scale, uh, but it's not just a personal workshop either. These could be worked by free wage earners or by slaves, but regardless, they were usually run by wealthy aristocrats from the patrician or equestrian class in ancient Rome then they'd usually have a freedman or somebody like that uh, actually managing the workshop. We saw in the last lecture that Roman authors suggested that farming was the most noble and honorable way to invest in one's money, but we see here that that didn't stop the rich from also engaging in industry. Some of these pottery manufactories are known to us through the archaeological remains of the production sites themselves. So what you're looking at here, one recently uncovered production site, is from Malaga in southern Spain. Here we find the archaeological remains of hundreds of amphorae, along with the kiln site, you're looking at it here, where the pots were fired, and the large open workspaces where the vessels would have been constructed. Side note, uh, reeling, okay, the small thin parallel lines that you're looking at here on the right side of the slide, um, often happen on the inside of the amphora, and that's how we tell that these were thrown on a wheel. So there would have been some kind of uh, piece of wood or something like that to even out the thickness of the, the pot, and so that would have been placed on the inside, and that's why we get those very thin uh, parallel lines on the inside of the vessel. That's how we tell it was created on a wheel. The bodies would have been created first, then the foot, and then the neck would have been added to the body afterwards, and then after those were all together, they would have fired the vessel. We also have evidence for these pottery manufactories from the amphorae themselves, and that's because the vessels were often stamped. The stamps could indicate the manufactory where the vessel was made, the name of the official controlling the production process, or the amount or quality of wine uh, or the contents inside. In addition to stamps, which actually became part of the vessel, we also have writings that were scribbled on the side of the vessel. These were known in Latin as tituli picti, basically drawn titles. 
These could indicate the contents of the vessel, what type of wine it was, how much wine there was, so on and so forth. If it was a high quality one, it would note how long it was stored for, or long, how, how long it had already been stored for. If it was a cheap wine, it'd note the drink by date, so basically the expiration date of the wine. And you can imagine how, these, how valuable these are in reconstructing the trade routes that were used in antiquity, because they allow us to see where the amphora was first constructed, where the wine came from uh, that filled the amphora, and where the wine and amphora eventually ended up. This all has the potential to be complicated if amphorae were reused again and again and again. But although we have a bit of evidence for this happening in antiquity, often in the form of the Tituli Picti being crossed out and rewritten, it seems to be the exception rather than the rule. For the most part, they were used once and discarded. What that means is that tens of millions of amphorae were created each year for the transportation and distribution of hundreds of millions of liters of wine. This necessitated wealthy investors to fund the operation, workers to get the clay, potters to form the vessels, and kiln operators to fire the, pot, fire the pots. And that's all before the wine ever made it onto a ship. One of the things you'll notice when you look at the map of trade networks in ancient Rome, and here you're looking at all the different networks funneling out from Rome itself, uh, is that quite a lot of this is happening by sea. And that makes sense when you think about the relative cost of transportation based on different types of methods. Roman archaeologists estimate that transportation by sea was five times cheaper per mile than transportation by river. And it was over 25 times cheaper per mile to transport something by sea than it was to transport that same thing over land. And while the exact numbers or ratios are still debated, it's clear that shipping by sea was the cheapest, quickest way to get goods from their place of production to their place of sale or consumption. If you already know anything about ships in the ancient Roman world, and that's probably a minority of you guys already, you probably heard about Roman triremes. These were Rome's warships with three rows of rowers who would propel the ship at enemy vessels, hoping to sink them by ramming the protruding bronze ram into the hull of enemy boats. Merchant ships were obviously quite a bit different. So first of all, Roman merchant ships could vary drastically in size. We found shipwrecks that are tiny, as little as four people, suggesting that this was a family business for some. But we've also found massive cargo ships that help transport grain, olive oil, and wine from the provinces to the major metropolitan centers like Rome, Alexandria, Carthage, and Antioch. The smaller end of these massive cargo vessels could carry about 75 tons, 150,000 pounds, and were usually less than 100 feet long. Moderately sized ships could hold around 3,000 amphorae and carried a load of 150 tons, 300,000 pounds. The largest of the Roman transport vessels could hold nearly 600 tons, 1.2 million pounds, and somehow still float. And that would be about 10,000 amphorae or 250,000 liters of wine. With these weights, the Romans clearly knew what they were doing in the shipbuilding department. When constructing these massive vessels, they started with building the hull, the part that sat in the water, then built the rest of the frame tying the whole vessel together. The planks were fit together using what's known as a mortise and tenon method, where small pieces of wood were inserted into the larger planks and then set in place with a dowel rod. To propel these behemoths, the Romans relied primarily on wind. Clean energy, good for them, in large part because it was less labor intensive than trying to row a ship of that size. And this serves as one of the major differences with the war-focused triremes, which were very much driven by rowing. Because of the size of the vessels and the fact that they were sailing rather than rowing, Roman shipping was hev heavily reliant on the prevailing winds of the Mediterranean. Ships would generally sail in a counterclockwise fashion around the Mediterranean, sailing east closer to the African coast, and then going north along the Levant, and then sailing west closer to the Anatolian and European coast. One could expect to cover maybe 100 kilometers a day on a good day, meaning that the trip from Alexandria to Rome via ship would take about 20 to 30 days depending on the speed and the winds. Roman sailor, sailors navigated by using written records that described landmarks, as well as by using the stars to locate north and navigate accordingly. And to some extent, the Greeks and Romans had developed sophisticated devices to keep track of the movements and location of stars that helped them navigate. The most famous of these is what you're looking at here, the Antikythera mechanism, 
which has a series of interlocked gears, where all the different gears moved if you just moved a single one. This was used to calculate, uh, used to keep track of astronomical events, as well as days and months and years, things like eclipses as well. Sort of kind of a fancy calendar and sky chart, as well as sort of kind of an early analog computer. Despite all these advances, not all ships made it to their destination. And while that was probably a bummer for most of the people sailing on them, it's good for us as archaeologists trying to figure out the hows, what's, and why's of ancient maritime trade. We currently have evidence for somewhere around a thousand shipwrecks dating to the Roman Republic and Empire. And when we look at this in context of the number that came before and after, we can get a sense for how much more trade must have been going on during the Roman Empire than compared to archaic Greece or the early Middle Ages. Basically, more shipwrecks I mean probably not that they were sinking at a different rate, but rather that there were just more ships sailing and trading at that time. Little side note here. Uh, we find most of these shipwrecks by seeing the ceramic amphorae that they've left behind. Often the wooden ships themselves are heavily destroyed, uh, disintegrate, um, but the amphora are nearly indestructible and very easy to spot using sonar. You can imagine how the ships of, uh, of this size of the massive kind of Roman merchant vessels would have required an equally impressive set of ports and harbors at which to dock. And lo and behold, we can see this archaeologically in the Roman world. During the late Republic and early Empire, Roman ports thrive in Italy and beyond. The port of Alexandria in Egypt, the recreation of which you're looking at here, was famous for its massive lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In Italy itself, the ports of Ostia and Portus saw incredible amounts of maritime traffic. Legendarily founded by the fourth king of Rome, Ancus Marcius, Ostia may have been Rome's first official colony. The name of the city literally means mouth, and that's because it's found at the mouth of the Tiber River, where it flows into the Mediterranean Sea, the very river that Rome is located on. As the early port of Rome, Ostia needed both uh, to tend to the massive ships carrying grain, olive oil, and wine, while also providing the necessary infrastructure for everyone who needed to work at the port. So you had to be able to live there as well as work there. At its peak, the city likely had a diverse population of around 100,000 people. And wine was such a big part of the maritime trade coming into Ostia that it had its own wine cellars guild operating full time within the port. By the time of the early Roman Empire, the frequency and size of ships coming into Italy had outgrown what Ostia was able to handle, and the Roman Emperor Claudius commissioned the building of a new port, cleverly named Portus, <laughs> uh, that was better suited to the scale of imperial trade. Part of what made all this possible was Roman technological advancements. While Rome didn't invent bricks, they were able to produce them on a massive industri industrial scale fairly cheaply. If you go to Ostia today, you'll notice nearly every building is made up of bricks at its core. It was a durable, cheap material that allowed for a wide variety of architectural forms. Even more important to the invention uh, was the invention of concrete, which was incredibly strong and incredibly light. It allowed Rome to build huge ceilings like the Dome of the Pantheon. And it was also crucial to the building of ports. By mixing volcanic ash with the concrete, it created a mixture that was able to harden underwater, and this became the key feature for most Roman ports and harbors at that time. Once massive ships arrived at Ostia or Portus, they had to offload the wine-filled amphorae into smaller boats that were able to traverse the Tiber River up to Rome itself. And here it's important to remember the relative costs of transportation. So remember, with river transportation, uh, it was five times as expensive as sea transport and land transportation perhaps 25 times as expensive as sea transport. Rome itself, just for a frame of reference, is about 15 miles north of Ostia, and ships had to go upstream to get there. Once in Rome, there were numerous harbors for different types of goods coming into the city. We have evidence for the Portus Vinarius, the wine port, and it appears that there was at least one more of these serving a similar function um, to offload wine once in the city of Rome. Most of these offloading ports were located in the southern part of the city. Here the amphorae were offloaded from the ships and put onto carts or donkeys. Sometimes the wine was left in amphorae for land transport, but very often it was unloaded in what's known as a culius, in Latin, uh, essentially an animal skin that's been turned into a wine sack. 
And this was done because it was significantly, would significantly reduce the weight for overland transport. You know, if each amphora weighs 50 pounds, now you're putting it in a wine sack that empty maybe weighs a few pounds, uh, you're saving quite a bit of weight. The wine would be purchased at this point by a wine wholesale distributor who would then sell it to a variety of shops or people, or it would be bought directly uh, by retailers and commercial establishments. The empty amphorae were occasionally reused, but most often they were just discarded. And if you think back to the numbers we were talking about earlier, this is like kind of crazy to think about. If you've got around 400, uh, 4 million amphorae of wine coming into Rome each year, that's a lot of amphorae trash even if you do reuse some of them. Because it was heavy and expensive to move them around, amphorae were often broken and discarded right there, right near the docks uh, where they were pulled off the ships. These broken amphorae would then stack together into what amounts to a giant landfill. And absolutely amazingly, that landfill of amphorae still exists today. It's called Monte Testaccio and it towers over the city of Rome, reaching a height of 115 feet and totaling a volume of over half a million cubic feet, all completely composed of amphorae. And it's a little bit different to see here because you're looking at uh, the vegetation that's covering it. But once we look at the inside, you can see what it's made of. It's estimated that over 50 million amphorae were discarded there, most of them olive oil amphorae from Spain. Seeing the cutaway of the mountain gives you a visual sense, perhaps more than any other image could of the massive scale of the wine and olive oil trade in ancient Rome. So we've talked at length about uh, kind of large scale, long distance trade when it comes to the wine industry. And certainly with massive cities like Rome, it's likely that wine traveled by river or sea to get to the metropolis. But what about smaller places? The Roman town of Pompeii, destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, gives us a good sense for what things were like in the normal towns of Italy and perhaps the provinces as well. A study of amphora stamps at Pompeii showed that about 70% of the wine was local, and another 20% kind of from the region in general, meaning about 10% was really imported from foreign lands. In this case, the wine sellers, either wholesalers or retailers, would have likely skipped the shipping steps going straight to the winery to get the wine. The coolest that we just talked about, the leather wineskin, would have been their main mode for transporting the wine over land since it's so much lighter than transporting using ceramic amphorae. And we actually get a cool description from Cato talking about how wine was measured out to fill, these, uh, fill the coolest. Basically what there was, the winery would have a giant rectangular box. And in the bottom of that, there would be a hole with a stopper in it. And on the inside of that box, there were different lines indicating different measurements. And so you'd pour in the wine into the box with the stopper in there. It would raise up to whatever line you wanted to, to purchase. So you'd have whatever it was. In modern terms, it might be uh, 10 liters or 20 liters or 50 liters. And then at that point, you'd hook up the, uh, you'd hook up the coolius to the spout, pull the stopper, and then it would disperse, dispense exactly that much wine into the wine sack. Once back in the city, there were two main types of places that sold wine. First, there were the wholesalers, whose entire business was wine. They'd sell wine both to bars and restaurants and to people themselves. A sculptural relief from the catacombs of Callistus, just outside of Rome, shows the wholesaling process. Wine would be brought in and stored in amphorae like you see on the left. Then wine would be poured from an amphora into a crater, and you've heard that term before, where it's mixed with water. That wine would then be offered to the customer, who we see sitting here holding a sack of money. And the customer could taste it before the purchase was made. Kind of like going to a wine tasting in Napa Valley today. The entire amphora, or some part of thereof, could then be sold to the customer. If the customer wanted less than an entire amphora, portions would be doled out just like with the process we talked about uh, using the coolius earlier on. And we can see from this other sculptural relief from Dijon, France, that wine was poured into a vessel with a stopper on the bottom. Different amounts would be marked on, uh, with a line on the inside of the bowl, and then the wine would be filled to whichever level the customer wanted. The stopper would then be pulled and the wine flowed into the customer's wineskin or flagon or ceramic vessel. The other type of wine establishment 
were the bars and restaurants that served wine along with food, women, and entertainment. We'll talk more about these in our next lecture. But just know for now uh, that bars in the ancient Roman world were just as popular and often just as raucous and just as dirty as bars in the contemporary world. Looking at examples from Pompeii, it's, easy, it's fairly easy to identify these establishments archaeologically because they look like what you see here. Mainly they have a massive bar in front of the shop facing onto the street. And based on their frequency, they seem to be doing good business. As time went on, the massive trade networks created for the distribution of grain, wine, and olive oil appear to have broken down. And we can see this in the ports that fall out of use and in the reduction uh, in the number of shipwrecks that we find, suggesting a decline in the amount of trade. That's not quite the end of the story, though. Towards the end of the Roman Empire, wine began to be transported in wooden barrels as opposed to ceramic vessels. And that's very much how we store wine uh, in wineries around the world today. Now, not only did this give it a nice oaky flavor, like a nice Napa or French uh, Cabernet, uh, but it also has implications for how we identify shipwrecks. So one of the things we talked about was how shipwrecks are identified by the ceramic amphorae themselves. But here, once we switch over to wooden barrels, those things can disintegrate just like the ships themselves. So even though we see that big kind of drawback in the wine trade or in the number of shipwrecks during the early Middle Ages, we have to think that that may be due not just to reduction in ships, but also to changes in the way that wine is distributed across the Mediterranean. So anyway, we do think that trade went down, the distribution of wine shrank slightly, uh, but we have to always keep in mind other possibilities for explanations um, other than just kind of changes in, in the different level of transactions.